Hey, Tyler, the calendar has flipped over to October and means a lot of people have some cash ready and they're looking for some great ideas of where to invest. We have a couple of stocks that could be monster stocks that we think now is the time to be buying. Jason, I've reached deep into the bag into the Tyler Crow's weekly ob obscure stock, and I think I found a really good one. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to talk about because it depends on how you define monster in the past, how you might want to talk about these stocks. So we'll have a little bit of fun with that term. How about if I go first? Go for it. I like going last sometimes. Yeah, yours is three people are going to watch this video that will we'll know about yours. I'm going to... We'll keep mine, waiting. Mine has had its moments where it, it's been well-known. And the stock I'm going to talk about is Confluent. So Confluent went public during the pandemic, raised a bunch of cash. Like a lot of other cloud software stocks, it's still down a ton from its peak. And it's actually continued to sell off recently. So my definition of it for a monster so far, the cynical me is like, it's the kind of monster that's been eating my portfolio, not the good kind of monster. But I think it's going to really grow a ton, and I think it's misunderstood, and there's a, just a really great opportunity to be buying the stock right now. So I'm going to just a brief explanation of what uh, Confluent does, make a couple of key points, and why I think right now it is time to be buying it. So Confluent's business, they're, they're kind of the category creators of data streaming. The founders of the business created an open source tool called Apache Kafka that most of the Fortune 500 uses. Uh, it's an open source tool to do data streaming, which the best way to put it is that's that's the sea change that's happening with how companies put their data to work as quickly as possible. Instead of letting it come in and then running batch reports out of these different tools that they use, you can actually stream that data as it's being acquired by the business and use it in real time. So it's really powerful. Uh, Kafka was built to run on servers that you're managing. And one of the fastest growing parts of the business is Confluent Cloud. They've built a version of Kafka that runs in the cloud. A couple of advantages, a lot of companies, of course, are shifting more of their data and more of their apps to the cloud. So Confluent for the cloud is where the data is already. It runs with Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, all of the major providers. In addition to their Confluent platform, which is their legacy product that companies uh, can use if you, and manage themselves. The other nice thing about Confluent Cloud is like one of the benefits of run, moving to the cloud is you don't have to manage everything. You don't have to have the staff to do it all yourself. And with Confluent Cloud, Confluent helps manage that product. And as a result, we can see that Confluent Cloud business right now, it makes up 50% of revenues. It is by far the fastest growing part of the business, still growing at about a 40% clip. And you can see that even though the growth rate has slowed, where it's at a point where 40% revenue growth off of the base is adding more revenue than prior quarters did where the growth rate was higher. That's just the benefits of scale kind of playing out. Now, one of the things that has the market maybe not super excited is again, the subscription revenue growth rate is slowing overall. But again, the reason that's happening is Confluent Platform, the running on your local servers version is growing at a much lower rate and it's still almost half the business. As a result, it's pulling the growth rate down. But what we're gonna see happen because the Confluent Cloud has gotten so large is I think we're gonna start to see an acceleration of revenue growth. And at the same time that's happening, we're seeing the business get up to scale, Tyler. It's basically, it's the cloud software recurring revenue business model playbook working exactly as it should. This is back to when the company went public in 2021. Raised a bunch of cash, went public at a relatively steady state of burn. And then immediately that cash burn rapidly accelerated because Tyler, they did what companies do like this when they go public. They take the money from the IPO and they spend it to accelerate growth. And that's what Confluent did. Now, what we're seeing happen at this point is we're seeing a turn of where all of those revenue dollars that we talked about here, those incremental revenue dollars in the dark blue right here, as those numbers build, that $10 million is higher margin than that initial $107 million base, right? Because you get operating leverage. So as a result, that operating leverage hits, cash burn shrinks. And we're right at the point now, Tyler, where management says the 2024, the full year, this is the last quarter that we're in right now that we've just entered into, the company's going to be a cash flow break even, free cash flow break even. That is a massive shift for a company like this. Because what happens after this is as you continue adding revenue, you start generating gobs and gobs of free cash flow. I have one more thing I want to talk about here, because this is something that people talk about as a real concern with these tech startups that have recently gone public and that stock-based compensation and the painful dilution that comes along with it. 
that means your piece of the pie gets a little bit smaller with the new shares that get issued. So we see it right here. Dilution, again, has been a substantial issue. Three and a half percent a year is a lot. What's happening, go back to the cloud software IPO boom, the SPAC boom period. There was a wonderful opportunity for companies to raise capital and go public quickly. And that meant that Confluent went public more quickly than I think they expected to because there were a lot of pre-IPO options grants that are bigger than usual when companies go public. So that's been a challenge. And again, the long-term goal is for dilution of less than 2%. And for these high margin, high cash margin businesses, they can generate enough cash flow to offset that dilution um, at scale with buybacks. And, and I think we're getting closer to the point to see that. Here's the last chart that I want to share, because this is a business that's still growing at a very high rate, is close to that inflection point, has addressed a lot of the concerns about it. I've got some newer, high success cloud software businesses and the, the greatest software company in the history of humankind, Microsoft, here. And this is price to sales. Again, it's not a great metric, but I think used within this context, it's useful to see where the price to sales multiples for similar software companies that have gotten to scale and been really profitable and successful. This is deeply, deeply discounted. And I think it's discounted to the level that it's created a substantial opportunity for investors that peel back some layers and really see the opportunity here to buy this stock that I really think is gonna be one of those great monster 3X, 5X, 10X winners over the next five to 10 years that make Confluent really, really high conviction for me right now. All right, we're gonna get a little simpler here. We're gonna go from cloud-based cloud service businesses to grocery stores because that's where I like to where I like to live. But we're going to go a little bit more unique here because this monster stock just went. I just IPO'd actually earlier this year. And the name of the company is BBB Foods tickers T B B B. It is a Mexican hard discount grocer. For those of you who don't know what hard discount is, it's you know the stores where the stuff's on the pallets on the floor rather than like up on shelves and stuff like that. It sells for really really cheap prices. That's the concept of the hard discount grocer. TBBB, where actually it's for Tienda uh, BBB. It's a, the name of the store in Mexico. It's one of the first hard discount retailers in all of Mexico. And I, I'd like to think that I'm a pretty, when it comes to evaluating stocks, I'm a pretty unemotional kind of guy. But when I read the IPO perspective of this company, I kind of fell in love. I'm not going to lie. The founder of this company, Anthony Hatoum, basically was like a, he was an investment bank analyst who studied hard discount grocers in Turkey and saw how successful the business was, did a kind of a study and decided, wow, if somebody did this in Mexico, they could make a ton of money. So in 2005, he basically moved down to Mexico, hit the pavement to figure out exactly how to build a hard grocer in Mexico and has done it. Today, they have about 2,500 stores, and this past quarter, they added 121 with a new distribution center. What impresses me the most, you know, aside from that story, is kind of the meticulous care that management went into designing the, not only the store, but also like the packaging and everything that they plan to sell on site. They tend to keep a lower count of SKUs, uh, shelf keeping units, because they, you know, they kind of did a sampling of what people wanted specifically. And uh, on top of that, it's little things of like where they located their store within foot traffic, what size packaging we wanted, because we see that all of our people uh, that shop with us have to carry by hand and walk home. And they're probably buying things two to three times a week. This is the kind of detail they went into their prospectus. And I was like, these people know their customers. They know exactly what they want to do. And it's showing. This quarter alone, same store sales were up 10%. It's growing revenue at an even faster clip. Like I said, about 121 new stores this quarter. And according to their kind of their white space study in the IPO's perspective, they expect they can get another 12,000 stores available in Mexico. So we're talking a 6X increase on its footprint over the next several years as it's built it out. And, it, and like it's the kind of business, Tyler, that now it's not the, to the same extent of a confluent but it is the kind of business where operating leverage is a big part of it. Yeah, especially what well, they even mentioned it too. It's once we get a certain amount of stores within the reach of a distribution center, our profitability mm -hmm. starts to skyrocket. So that's where we're talking about economic scales. And it really shows up in their numbers too. It isn't quite net income profitable. It was a private company, so it had some high interest debt before it went public. That's starting to whittle its way down. Uh, it can also access the capital markets now, so possibly cheaper debt in the future. But 
you know, on a profitability basis, it, it turns over its inventory 17 times a year, which even for the top flight grocers in the United States, that would put them on the higher end on an EBIT basis or so earnings before interest and taxes. It's about a 2% margin, which is pretty par for the course for grocers. It's it, mm -hmm. like I said, it's not a high margin business, but we're turning over it's volume, a, it's very, a volume very fast. Business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so. Right. With these sort of qualities, high same store sales growth, it's the model is really catching on in Mexico and with so much white space for additional stores over the next several years, I really have a feeling this is going to be one of the fastest growing retailers in Mexico. And I think investors should really pay attention to what's going on here.